Welcome to Inside New York. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. Hi, this is Shaka Khan, and you're watching Inside New York. <laughs> From modest beginnings in Baltimore, Maryland, to an international billion dollar empire. My grandfather said, know your job, and I can promise you'll never be in a bread line. Since the beginning, Reginald F. Lewis was destined for success. I signed him up for camp, and he said, who's going to take care of my business? And I said, I will. And the first thing he said when he walked through the door, where's my money? A man with an unconventional approach to conventional institutions. I was told that he is the only person to get into Harvard Law School without formally applying. The thing I admired about Reginald Lewis, he was a take charge kind of a guy. The sheriff reached for me. Reggie grabs the sheriff's arm and said, wait a minute, who are you? I'm the high sheriff, who are you? And Reggie said, I'm Reginald F. Lewis. I represent uh, Reverend Shavers. Yes, he was a Wall Street highly trained corporate lawyer, but he was a strong freedom fighter for civil rights. Welcome to Inside New York. We are honored and delighted to have on today's program, Lloyda Nicholas Lewis, who is the chairman of the Reginald Lewis Foundation. And she's here to celebrate the premiere of a PBS documentary on her husband, Reginald F. Lewis, The Making of a Billion Dollar Empire. Lloyd is going to share with us much more about this great pioneer right here on Inside New York. So we welcome Lloyd Lewis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. You know, we've known each other. It seems like nearly 30 years. I'm celebrating 25 years on the show. Congratulations. And we've never had you on, so this is such an honor. Thank you. The so, honor is mine. Yes. Well, as I you know, said in the introduction, the main reason why you're here is to celebrate the premiere of this PBS documentary, Reginald F. Lewis, The Making of a Billion Dollar Empire. Yes, thank you for having me here. In fact, it has been 30 years ago when he did the billion dollar deal of buying Beatrice International Foods. And so 30 years ago, it was a big deal. It was all over the papers. And since then, those who have been born after 1987, who are probably you know, under 40, do not know anything about him. So I'm so glad that PBS, WNETW, is showing it in Long Island, in New York City, and in New Jersey, starting February yes. 16. Right, they can check their listings, because for New York City, that's also WNET, that's right. uh, Channel 13, as it was, you know, still called, I believe. And the um, best thing about it is that because it is a public television, they can find it after, after February 18, yes. streaming online. Now, Na remember, right. WLIW.org. Right. They can just go to the website and they'll see the listings of when it's going to air in their area. And this is something that's becoming much more common. Um, you know, we, we hope to do that now after 25 years to also have our shows on demand so that you can see them at any time if you miss the airing. And it's just so wonderful. Many people know that there yes. was the first black man to do a billion dollar purchase of an overseas company. And so it happened in 90, 30 years ago. And so I want people to know that there was a man who did it. Yes. From humble beginnings, and yet was able to go to the heights of corporate America by buying a billion dollar company. Yes. You know, when I was coming here to the studio, I was just thinking, empire. A lot of young people 
know of the show Empire, which is so popular, but many of them don't know that there's actually a person who owned a billion dollar empire in 1987 who is African American. That's right. He bought Beatrice International Foods for nearly a billion dollars and it was consisting of 64 companies in 31 countries. Right. How about that? Reg Lewis in many ways was the Jackie Robinson of business. I have to admit, when I first met Reg, I wasn't told <laughs> that, 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 that he was black. There weren't that many black entrepreneurs in New York City at the time. And I understand also from the research that this was really considered phenomenal and such a rare occasion for this to happen, not just that he was the first African-American, but for anyone. So um, that needs to be noted. And he also was the first African-American to have a law firm on Wall Street. And as the stock market is growing in leaps and bounds, just think what it was like, and you can share what it was like in those days to have a firm on Wall Street. Well, even before that, I think what is more important is that when he was looking to enter law school, there was from Harvard Law School a summer program and he was able to join around 60 African-American from the historically black colleges and universities. And during that time, he excelled so well so that Professor Sanders of Harvard Law School told him, if you want a seat in the class of 68 of Harvard Law School, you're in. So that's... Without applying, without writing, uh, paying the fee for the LSAT, he was the first person to enter Harvard Law School without even applying. Yes, that is absolutely extraordinary. When I saw that, I was like, how did that happen? That he could be admitted without, you know, having to go through the process. That just seems so, you know, un unfathomable. But there's so much that's seemingly unfathomable, like why he would, you know, how, what propelled him to, you know, to these heights, to end up being a pioneer and, you know, owning this billion dollar company. I, I assume, but I shouldn't assume, uh, you know certainly a lot of the history. Um, when did you first meet well, your husband? I think your question of how did he aspire for that, it really starts with the family. He uh -huh. was raised by a single mother, but with a very, very loving, um, family situation because when his mother left his father when he was five, he was brought to his grandfather's place. Mm -hmm. And the grandfather and grandmother, his mother, had nine other brothers and sisters. And so they all loved him. And his grandmother always said, you will do great things. So even from the very start, he was told. And when they talk about the racism and discrimination, he would say, yeah, why should white guys have all the fun? Yes. In fact, that's the title of his book. Exactly. Yes, why should white guys have all the fun? How mm -hmm. Reginald Lewis created a billion dollar business empire. And it's still amazing, available on Amazon.com. Absolutely, I remember when that came out. But what happened from there? Is that where the two of you met? Well, when he was as, um, just an associate at Paul Weiss, the first, the first law firm that mm -hmm. accepted him after he graduated from Harvard Law School, I was also um, on a world, round the world trip because I was admitted as a lawyer in the Philippines. Yes. And I, uh, I worked with a civil rights law firm. My boss was from Harvard Law School, African American and I introduced him to my sister who was at Columbia University. Of course, he was fast, they were going out on a date. Huh. And so he told me, Loida, do you want to have a blind date? Uh, you know, it will be a, you know, uh -huh. your sister and me and then a classmate of mine and me. I said, sure, why not? Called Reginald Lewis. And he said, no, no, I'm too busy. You know, they work 15 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's too bad, that's too bad, Reg. You know, she comes from the Philippines, wait. I've never dated an Oriental before, I'm coming. <laughs> oh that's, my, yes, well, yes. that's a lot to say. Well, the thing is that what he was, was always like? ready. He was always ready for new adventure. Yes. And of course I was ready too. And how was that first date? Did you know right then and there? You know, so many people say, 
I'm going to marry this person. No, was I'm, like I was that? not going to get married by then. I was going okay. back to the Philippines, enter politics, which is my father's dream for me. In okay. fact, he had a movie theater named after me, Loida Theater. Wow. So that when I run for public office, I already have name recognition. Oh, my goodness. But that first meeting, we were like in sync immediately. Mm -hmm. Whatever I say, he had something to say. Mm -hmm. Whatever he said, I had something to say. We were talking nonstop. Mm -hmm. So there was... Mm -hmm. But what I remember most is that when he said, when I was talking about, you know, being African-American, he was, mm -hmm. uh, I was going to talk about, you know, race relations, and he immediately cut me short. I'm international. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be treated as right. a black man. He was international, not mm -hmm. just American, but international. And 20 years later, sure enough, he was international, operating 64 companies in 31 countries. And so you knew him from the time he started working out of law school and, and became at some point, obviously, part of that whole journey, which has to be well, extraordinary. not really, because huh? I told him, I'm not going to marry you. I'm going back to the Philippines. But that didn't last long, uh, obviously. Yes. Or did you go back and no, come back? No, I was on the plane. But just on the plane, I was so sad because knowing him for you know, five months, uh -huh. I knew that I will not meet a man like him again. Sure. He was just special. He was more intense, uh -huh. more driven, more hardworking, more of a visionary than I was. And I thought I was yes. bad. <laughs> because you were. And, and for those who don't know, you were the first Filipino woman to be accepted by the New York Law uh, by association, I should say, that had not attended law school in the United States. So you are a woman of many firsts as well. Well, I was, you know, uh, since I was already a lawyer in the Philippines and yes. I married him and I was here in the United States, why not take the bar? Especially when the United States Supreme Court in 1974 said citizenship should not be a bar in taking the bar exams. It should not be a requirement. And so I took the bar and passed it the first time. Wow. Without studying in the United States. Wow, that is extraordinary. You know, he knew he had, a, he had someone very special and unique also. Well, I think when I left, he was also, he, he, he told his mother. He called his <gasps> mother and then she has left. And mom was saying, what? What happened? Go to, to, go to where she lives. But by that time, I had left. And so when I was in... Stanford with my friends who were studying for PhD mm -hmm. and they saw how sad I was because really I was sad. I couldn't see any color. I knew that I'll never meet, meet someone like him again. And so my friend said, well, Lloyd, if you're that sad, why don't you call him? Never occurred to me. Mm. Call him. Women's darling, rights. Darling, I'm coming back. And so that's how it happened. So no, so you didn't go back home, but you went to Stanford. Is that where you were going to? No, learn? we were going around the world. I mean, meaning to say, we were going to Southeast Asia because okay. that was the plan. Okay? okay, we planned to go to Korea, to uh, Taiwan, to Hong Kong, and then back to the Philippines. Two weeks going back to the Philippines. Oh, but in Stanford, we stopped to get our friends, you know. Oh. And so I said, I'm coming back, and then he said, No, you're already on your way. You know, go and finish your, your t journey and then come back here and we'll get married. Yes. So he, he uh, in essence, proposed after five months. No, no, no. Uh, what really so, happened was, okay. as we were falling in love with each other, yes. we were on the subway. And then I said, darling, do you want a big wedding or a small wedding? And he said, I think a small wedding. Where do you think we should get married? Uh, at uh, NYU Chapel. That's nice. And then suddenly he realized what happened. I have a headache. So I really proposed to him. Oh, <laughs> see that? That's wonderful. But then after that, I had second thoughts. That's why I said, no, I'm going back to the Philippines. That's what happened. Oh. He didn't propose. I did. Oh. And then I changed my mind. And then on the way home, I knew that he's the man for me. And, and that's so when you called him. I called him and he said, go back to the Philippines. And that's where we got married. He went to the Philippines by himself. You know, he was just a lawyer. He could not yes. bring anybody. And so my father gave me a first class wedding in the Philippines. 
Oh, that is so romantic. That is so fantastic. I mean, and, it was and destiny. It was definitely destiny. Destiny. I was not supposed to get married. I was going to be in politics. But uh -huh. that's, that's, you know, God has certain plan. And if you right. are true to yourself, and if you, you know, if you ask for wisdom and discernment and ask your own heart, he will show you. Sure. So you were there, obviously, when he moved on from that law firm to form his own law firm on Wall Street. And then, of course, to that major deal of the acquisition of TLC Beaches. Well, as he always what? says, when he hit the headline, because nobody knew him, he, yes. was, he had very, 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 you know, very, very, um, he didn't seek publicity. Mm -hmm. He always says performance, not publicity. Okay. But he always says, I'm not an overnight success. He was in the mill, you know, he was, <laughs> he was working hard mm -hmm. as a law firm. And that was, what, 20 years of working, creating deals, helping companies, African-American, because okay. he was the uh, general attorney for A.A. Mesbik, a African-American minority investment firm. Uh -huh. he would, so he would help them buy companies or he would help the funders, those giving money. And so he had you know, that experience of 100 million deals, mm. 100 million dollar deals, so mm. that when he is ready for his own, to do his own, he had experience. But you know, and this is what people forget, oh my God, he did one billion. But before that, he had three failures. Mm. He, did, he, was, he wanted to buy Park Sausages. Uh -huh. He had the money that was for three million, but it was sold to somebody else. Wow. The second one, he was going to buy TV stations and mm -hmm. he was gathering, you know, you had to buy, you know, you had to get your financing together. Mm -hmm. And before he could do it, they sold it to somebody else. The third one was a furniture company in California for eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. And he had the money. They were closing on the day of closing. The man who was Caucasian, white, mm -hmm. part of the deal is that he will work for him. So he had a change of heart. And mm. he accused my husband of a lie, mm. that he was going, he wanted him to work with two books, one for IRS and one for them. That was a lie. So as soon as my husband said that, what, you bleep, bleep, bleep. Uh -oh. And the other one said, you bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> I Why? mean, all the curses was fall, And the deal broke on yes. the day of closing, third failure. So what would you say what would you attribute his success outside of the fact, like you said, he had been doing a lot of deals, but it's not just doing a lot of deals. Everything has to come together. And they can be, you know, cut in, in just someone just waking up with a, you know, I don't know, a headache or whatever in a moment, you know, the whole deal, which he, must have taken a long time to even. Well, he always develop. says a deal can break at any scene. Exactly. So three failures. How did he do? I mean, how did he say? Did he say, oh, because he was racist? For me, it was true. Uh -huh. The man didn't want to sell and work for a black man. Mm. Or, oh, my lawyers didn't do their job. No. He started to look into himself. Three failures. The fault is within me, not mm. there. Mm. And so he said, what are the successful LBOs, leverage buyout, doing? Mm. Jimmy Goldsmith, Henry Kravis, mm. Ron Perelman. What did they do? And so he started to study all the successful LBOs, leverage buyouts, you know, borrowing money mm -hmm. to buy a company. And then he understood after understanding and after studying them, he was doing it all by himself. Mm -hmm. He was his own investment banker. He was his own uh, accountant. And he mm -hmm. was his own lawyer. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, he had a law firm. And so nobody was invested in him. And so having that, there's another deal that came along, Bacol Pattern. Mm -hmm. Women sewing dresses. Sure, I remember. And he said, you know, are women not uh, sewing still? No. Women are going to workforce. So the sales were going down. So it was cheap. In a way, it was cheap. Mm. And so he hired investment banker, Bear Stearns, Phyllis Les. Mm -hmm. He hired Deloitte & Touche for mm -hmm. accounting. And he hired Paul Weiss, his old law firm, yes. where he used to work. So they are invested in him. And he accomplished buying McCall Pattern Company for $22 million, all borrowed money.
Wow. In three years, it had the most successful revenue in all its 115 years of history. And so he bought, he sold it for a 90 to 1 return. Wow. 90 to 1 return. And ah, at that time, that's Mike Milken of Drexel Burnham heard about it, mm. or read it in the newspaper, mm. New York Times, and called it, Reg, come over here. Tell me about this successful deal, and I'll give you a bigger bat to hit with. Mm. And so that's how he I, was able to acquire the backing for of, this. Yes, Drexel Burnham. Okay. okay. So he, he was going to Drexel for, for around four or five years. Mm -hmm. And so he knew Mike. Mm -hmm. And so when he was called by Mike, he already had this germ of an idea of buying mm -hmm. Beatrice International Foods. Mm -hmm. And so he hired Mike Milken, Drexel, as his mm -hmm. investment banker. And that's how he did it. Wow, wow. Like you said, it, it's, you know, actions speak louder than words. And your husband was you know, quietly doing the work that was necessary. Learning from failures, and that's what I'd like to tell, uh, you know, your, your viewers. Yes. Okay. Failure is just another name for success, right. if you learn from it. Yes. But you fail, and you fail again, and you fail again, something is wrong with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you have to investigate, what are you doing wrong? Right, right. Well, Celebrate failure. Yes, a lot of people have said that they were very successful. For every no, they knew they were getting closer to a yes. So they welcomed the no, because that meant they'd be getting closer to a yes. So Learn I think from it's, failures, it's, it's yes. Definitely. Now tell us a little bit about talking about failures. The Wall Street firm, which was obviously not a failure and led to his, his great accomplishment, his you know, best known accomplishment. Um, how difficult though was it? Um, I know you said that your husband did not really want to talk about race um, as a way uh, that that was that that was a challenge, but it had to be as the first African American to have a law firm on Wall Street. So, could you talk about his challenges and well, how we for the met first them? year he was funded by uh, New by a New York foundation, but it was on a limited time, only for one or two years, and after that he had to hustle and he had to find companies. And so corporate companies, corporate corporations would hire him as a special counsel, his law firm, mm -hmm. Lewis and Clarkson. But once the CEO is changed, you're back to zero. Mm -hmm. That's why he said, you know, practicing, you, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's filled with um, booby traps because mm -hmm. even if you do 100% of a good job, when the CEO is changed, they change your special counsel. So he said, mm -hmm. I'll go back on the other side, on the investment side, because then the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, slowly he built his reputation. And when they wanted him to put a down payment of $1 million to buy McCall Pattern Company, mm -hmm. you don't accumulate that, even if you're a successful law firm, I mean, lawyer, mm -hmm. you don't accumulate $1 million. And so JP Morgan said, Reg, you've been coming here every year for the past 12 years, and you will show me your business plan. And every year, you exceeded your plan. Mm -hmm. So I lend you the money. Why? Because as a uh, sponsor in a deal, mm -hmm. you're entitled to a sponsor fee. Yes. So he said, I'll pay you within 30 days. So JP Morgan lent him the money, and 21 days later, he paid it when he closed McCall Pattern. Now, was this when he had the Wall Street law, law firm? firm? OK, before he beat it became more of an investment banking firm. That's right. Oh. You know, you have to, you have to pay your, your rent. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, you have children in school. So his law firm was doing, you know, he had law firm, he had um, partners, mm -hmm. Cla Charles Clark, and he had uh, four lawyers doing the business mm -hmm. while he was seeking, you know, how to buy a company. Yes. You need that. Absolutely. And it seemed like investment banking became an area where African Americans at least of my generation, were able to move into, although to a large extent it was the public finance versus the corporate finance well, area. Yes. So. Why it is so important to tell that in 1987 he broke through that? Yes. Because it's like Jackie Robinson of finance. Yes. Because before that nobody has done a big deal of a billion dollars. Right. And so everybody took notice, you know. Uh, Bob Johnson of BET, yes. Magic Johnson, and so many others. 
including the billionaire uh, Robert Smith. Mm. Okay, the one who is now the first African American chair of Carnegie Hall. Mm. Okay? He's managing, you know, billions and billions of of money, mm -hmm. you know, on software. But all I'm saying is that in 1987, when he broke the de when he brokered this deal, mm -hmm. it's like, who is this guy? You know, right. the, as I said, the Jackie Robinson. And from that time on, so many other African Americans, Latino, went into finance. And so you have many others, you know, big firms that are doing private equity, meaning doing what KKNR does. Finding mm -hmm. good companies, buying them, making them successful, and then selling them or going public, you know, that's the finance, finance story. Right, and that's where the money is. Because that's I, where the money I, is. I know a lot of my friends who are lawyers decided to move from, say, securities law to investment banking because they, they looked at their colleagues and they said, they're making all this money, especially when the stock market is doing well, you're going to be doing, all, doing very well. My daughter, Christina, was mm -hmm. only 12 when her father died. And so when she turned 30, that's the time that she started to ask herself, sort of like grieve, mm -hmm. and ask, who was my father? You know, mm -hmm. this, this big titan. Yes. And so he, she went back to Harvard Law School and interviewed Professor Sanders, mm -hmm. who was the one who said, Reg, if you want to enter the law school in 1965, you have a place. So she asked him, if my father were a young man today, where would he be? Corporate law? He said, no, technology. Yes. And that's why Christina started five years ago a special program for African, black, and brown boys, boys, high school, to study coding and technology. Yes. Because that's where the money is, technology. Right. Exactly. Well, that's where the money is, and that's where the future is, and that's where everything's going. Everything from, like, as, it, as you mentioned, this broadcast, which is going to be on demand. Yes. Um, yes. So, this film, you know, a documentary, Pioneers, Reginald F. Lewis, and the Making of a Billion Dollar Empire, will be in February. And uh, after that, it will be streaming online. Yes. WLIW.org. Thank yes. you. And we'll have this interview streaming as well. Oh, is that okay. right? It's wonderful. And Thank you for having me. 64 companies in 31 countries for almost $1 billion. So in that sense, he is a pioneer. The fact that we were able to close a gargantuan deal, given its international character, was just, uh, it, was, it was absolutely off the charts. There is no doubt that Reginald Lewis's success paved the way for me and many others.